Thank you very much for talking to us today. Um, I feel it's really important to say from the outset that we arrived at the Ministry here to seek media accreditation and that you agreed to talk to us uh, following a, an introduction. So um, I very much appreciate the fact that uh, you were so um, versatile in, in um, allowing us to come here. Um, why did you want to speak to us or why did you kind of agree to the interview? Oh, well, I hope, uh, first and foremost, I hope that your travels to Kabul have been safe uh, and I'm wishing you all the luck in your work. Uh, uh, secondly, to my office, it's part of the procedure. Foreign journalists come to my office and uh, I give them accreditation letter. Uh, and thirdly, uh, as you requested uh, an interview uh, and I consented, the reason is because I want the voice of the people of Afghanistan. We, as the representative of the people of Afghanistan, would uh, like to send our message to the world, a message of peace, of uh, coexistence, of positive relations. So you know immediately f from your response that people will have an issue with the fact that you believe that you are representative of the people of Afghanistan, that many will say you're not representative of the people of Afghanistan, that you took the country, took control of the country uh, through violence, and that you have um, essentially taken the voice of the people and that many people are unhappy. How would you respond to that? Uh, the part about violence uh, and the reason for violence is because uh, our country was occupied, it was invaded by foreign forces who tried to colonize us intellectually and physically, change our culture and our heritage. Uh, it was the people of Afghanistan that revolted violently uh, against the aggression and brutality that was imposed upon our people. Uh, so it was not something strictly related to us, the government. It was the people of Afghanistan who collectively decided that they do not want foreign ideologies and foreign uh, values to be imposed on our country. So you know that, again, some people would take an issue with that because they would say that a lot of people in the, Afghani in the Taliban aren't actually from Afghanistan, that many are from foreign countries, um, and you, you know that the, the importance that you stress on preserving um, Afghan culture and uh, traditions uh, isn't served by having people in the Taliban who aren't from this country, who aren't from this culture. Well, first the notion or the axiom that uh, the so-called Taliban uh, is made up of uh, foreigners, locals and foreigners, uh, is incorrect. And the notion that we are a threat to international security is incorrect. Uh, it has no basis. It has no evidence to back it up. The movement of Taliban that began in 94 was an indigenous movement that began in Kandahar province. Uh, and it was the people who backed and supported it to get rid of our, uh, our country from the malignant forces, the civil war that had uh, ravaged and destroyed our country to its core. And ever since that day, it has been an indigenous movement. It has grassroots support. It is actually the people of Afghanistan, uh, the, those that are neglected and those who do not have the same opportunity to appear on the media and have their voices heard, uh, it is uh, those people and it is that country that we represent. When you talk about the people of Afghanistan, a lot of people here suffered through the violence that for whatever reason and whoever was responsible, um, they lost their lives, their families, their relatives were killed, their children were maimed. It was a really, really horrific campaign of violence. And for many people um, who are from this country, they feel that the Taliban executed excessive violence in, in achieving its aims, and that is inexcusable. What would you say to that? I think excessive violence was used by those who had uh, access to excessive accessories of violence. We did not have jets. We did not have B-52 bombers. We did not have cruise missiles. We did not have the mother of all bombs. We did not have tanks, ABCs, or weapons of mass destruction, of chemical weapons. It was the brutal foreign invaders who had access to all of them, 
and they used every single weapon in the arsenal to attack and brutalize our people. So the notion that we used excess violence is absolutely incorrect. It has no basis. There is no evidence to back it up. We did what we had to do with the means that we had. And to gain our liberation, to liberate ourselves, we were prepared and we will remain ready, stand ready to use every means necessary to achieve and maintain our sovereignty and uh, our right to freedom and liberty. So to, all, to that point, um, I, I think there were recent peace negotiations in Norway um, and a delegation from the Taliban traveled to the, to the talks um, and a group of Afghan women living in Norway uh, criticized the fact that the Taliban were, were involved, this delegation from the Taliban was involved in the talks because they felt they shouldn't be recognized for um, the traumas and the violence that had um, been executed on, on the Afghan population. Um, so, so that's a view from people who lived here, who are from here. Um, what again would you say to those people who feel that you have no right to, to represent them? First, the, the meeting in Oslo was not a peace negotiation. It is uh, a part of our normal diplomatic mission and uh, it is a, a way of reaching an understanding with the international community, without the international community exercising violence against our people. Uh, the people that are living abroad, though it's a very tiny percentage, we have nearly Unfortunately, we've had 43 years of war. We have millions upon millions of Afghans living in Europe, living in our regional countries, in, in the Gulf countries. They are in no shape, way or form a representation or representative of the people of Afghanistan. They are perhaps, and we accept this, as in any other country, there's different and varying views uh, that people hold. Uh, it is possibly a, a, they represent a certain view that is on the fringes of our society, but we are the, the ideology, the values, the culture, we are a, a representation of that. The fact that I'm wearing these clothes, this attire, this is uh, innately Afghan. The people in Oslo that were protesting my Afghan nature were dressed uh, in something that was alien to us that was alien to the Afghan culture, it was alien to the Afghan people. Uh, so the mere fact that they, uh, in their self-delusion uh, and in their indignity, their self-hatred that was ingrained in their, in their thinking and their mindset that they have to look like a certain people for them to be accepted shows that they are not the representative of the Afghans. It is actually us who are the representatives of the people of Afghanistan. So do you think that people who do not choose to dress in, in Afghan attire, can, even though they may be born here, they may have grown up here, that they are not representative of the country because of what they wear? What I'm saying is the ideology that they represent, is uh, the attire that they wear is a representation of the ideology that they represent. And it is not Afghan in any shape, way or form. So... You seem to have quite a narrow um, interpretation or view of, of what being Afghan is, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, diversity in terms of people having you know, different views or different choices. It seems to be a kind of a narrow doctrine. If, if you don't mind me saying so, that seems quite narrow. Uh, I think it's, uh, you perhaps misunderstood it my worldview or my view or the view and the policy of uh, our government is not narrow. It is very broad-based. It is very inclusive. Uh, what I'm countering the point that, that somehow they are the representatives of the people of Afghanistan and we're not, that is what I'm contending. That is what I'm arguing against. If we balance the scales, I think we are more Afghan than they are. That's what I'm saying. But at the end of the day, they are Afghans. They have a right uh, to claim to Afghanistan. They have a right to live in Afghanistan. They have a right to, uh, to uh, help in its development, to contribute. Uh, uh, they have every single right that every Afghan has. They are Afghan at the end of the day. 
But the, the notion that they represent Af Afghanistan and we don't, that is what I'm contending. Do they have a right to speak out against the Taliban? Do they have a right to say this is wrong, we don't agree with this? Of course, of course. All Afghans have a uh, right to freedom of expression, the right to freedom of speech. So some of those people, I don't know, uh, I don't know in depthly, but some of those people at least fled Afghanistan recently in August. Um, so, uh, you know, up until very recently, they lived here um, and, you know, they would have been part of, of this uh, culture very in-depthly, but they fled because of the... Um, I don't, I don't know your views on takeover or, you know, uh, it was referred to as the Taliban takeover, but you sort of reasserted control um, across the country and, and they fled. Um, what, what do you, look, I'm interested in, in your views in terms of, last August the world saw pictures from Kabul airport of hundreds of people trying to flee you know, people running alongside planes, some people died because they, they hid and they tried to travel in the plane undercarriage, people handing their babies over walls. What did you feel whenever you saw your own people having that terrified reaction to the fact that, that the Taliban was going to take control? Uh, from my point of view, it was not so much uh, of uh, them being terrified of the Taliban whatever that, that is, I don't know what a Taliban is. Uh, but it wasn't the fact that they were terrified of us. It was more the United States uh, and the Hollywood image it has built up for itself. You can park that uh, airplane in India. You can park it in Iran. You can park it in Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan, and make an announcement to the people that anyone who makes it to the airport will be getting a free ride to the United States or European countries. We've only had a, a few thousand people rush to the airport and uh, the, the way they did it was very sad, uh, just as you explained. Uh, but if you park that in any of these uh, supposed uh, third world countries, you will have millions of people flocking to the airport trying to get out and it's not because of another government coming to power. It's more of the economic situation. It's more economic migration. Uh, so that is our point of view and that's what we've been saying. That uh, Afghanistan needs to have the opportunity to develop. It needs to have the opportunity given by the international community for it to not be sanctioned and have access to international markets and banks so it can provide to its people and the people, the Afghan people, feel safe that they have opportunity to live in their country and contribute. But, but we, saw, we saw with those images of the people at the airport, we saw men with guns in, in trucks um, dri driving through Kabul, driving through the city, driving through the countryside, um, and it, it appeared very much that people were absolutely petrified of them, of the violence they could inflict of them. It wasn't, I don't think, from, from what I saw, that they were choosing to live for a better life. I think it looked like they were fleeing for their lives because they were so terrified and they were desperate. Well, again, the art of deception practiced by, uh, by the Western media is, I think, to blame for what the perception that you have received. If it was fear of guns, I think the United States had more guns and more gunpowder than we could ever have had. If it was about trucks, the United States had more APCs, armored personnel uh, carriers, and other type of trucks, which were several times more terrifying than the simple trucks that, that were used by the indigenous fighters, the freedom fighters of Afghanistan. So again, it's not a petrification of the Taliban. It is more an economic migration, an opportunity presented itself to the poor people who naturally, because of the Hollywood image built up by the United States about the pastures being greener on the other side, is what drove the people to the airport. But that image of someone passing their child over the wall to a soldier, you don't give away your child because you, you think they'll have a better life in America. You are really desperate. I mean, I don't know if you have children. I have children. 
I would have to think I am, give, I am putting them over this wall because they will have a better life, a, a chance to survive. I mean, that, 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 is, that action, I think, is, is pretty clear. You know, this just validates my point even further. The person, however dishonorable uh, and degrading the act was of giving a child to a foreign soldier, an occupier, uh, however degrading that was, but it's an indication and it validates my point that it is for, as you pointed or as you rightly said, better opportunities. It was not because his life was threatened by the Taliban that were coming. It's not that, that the Taliban were going to kill his child. It just validates my point even further that it was for economic reasons. But maybe they thought that the Taliban, maybe he thought the Taliban might kill him. You know, I kill the father? Maybe, maybe they thought that their lives were in danger. And so they, they would give their child away? Well, I read recently that a family in, I think, northwestern Afghanistan, the mother and father had died and they had eight children and all eight children starved to death. So maybe, maybe they didn't think that they would be killed. Maybe they just felt that the economic circumstance, they could not provide for their children and their children would die in that really awful case. I've never heard uh, any credible media report any such case. Neither has it been reported by UNAMA or UNICEF or all the other international NGOs and organizations that are here in Afghanistan. No one has starved to death in Afghanistan so far. So you don't, you don't think malnutrition is at that stage yet? I, I agree that there is malnutrition. It's because of the sanctions imposed on us. It is, it is not because, again, it is because people see better opportunities economically outside Afghanistan because we are facing sanctions by the international community and the people are being punished for what they had no hand in. It is a collective punishment of the people of Afghanistan for the simple fact that they want to be free and liberated and not have, uh, not have the, uh, them being colonized by, by foreigners. There were reports, and maybe, maybe they weren't true, they weren't verified. Um, in the Western media uh, recently that the Taliban in Kabul was going door to door in districts and ransacking houses, searching for, I don't know, weapons because they feared that maybe people opposed um, them or, you, you know, so to, to me that would, that would incite fear in a population. Well, if, uh, as you can understand, and uh, maybe people don't appreciate the fact that Afghanistan has been through 43 years of war. The country is replete with weapons. And the new government and responsibility of every single government is to provide security to its citizens. So what the government did was announce an operation. It was not out of nowhere. There was an announcement made that our security forces will be going uh, to, uh, from house to house in, in Kabul, in Kapisa, and in Parwan provinces. Uh, and they announced to people, if you're willing to give us your weapons that, that have been stored in your house, we would really appreciate that. If not, we're going from house to house to collect weapons. It's not ransacking homes, it's not uh, terrifying people, it's just a normal search operation. And the police in, in Ireland, I'm pretty sure that they have a right to, to enter any house and carry out, uh, when they have a warrant, to carry out a search of their house to make sure that there's no uh, illegal weapons and other uh, illegal items in the home. Mm. You said earlier that um, the scenes from the airport, we'll just go back to that briefly, that people were maybe um, seeing those images because of Western media. Um, in RTE, we, we used footage that was actually gathered by Afghan broadcasters. Um, so the footage was coming from people within this country. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't material that we had got from other broadcasters. It came from the source. Do you think those broadcasters were, I mean, what would you say to that, that we, that, we, that we got the pictures from the actual broadcaster of the country, not through any other prism or another organization? I, I never doubted uh, the authenticity of the, the film, the footage that you had a look at. I'm just contending the point that they were terrified of the new government. What I'm saying is it's not the petrification of the government that was coming to power. It's more an economic opportunity 
for the poor people of Afghanistan to to migrate to this uh, to this wonderful Hollywood land where where it's shown that you will have cars, there will be beaches, you you'll be riding around in yachts, and when they migrate there, they understand the only thing they they're good for is is being a taxi driver. That's all they can do. So when their reality hits, they come back to their country. And we're seeing around latest statistics that we've had 500,000 Afghans return back to Afghanistan in the last six months. So you think a lot of people that left, aren't, you, have, you have seen the figures that would show that they're coming back, they're returning? Many, many Afghans are returning. Uh, in fact, I heard that those housed in Britain, are uh, the conditions are so bad that they're actually requesting the government to return them back to Afghanistan. And what, what sort of treatment would they get on their return? It, are they, you know, questioned or are there any, you know, would, would you um, a, ask them why they left? Would there be any repercussions for their leaving or do they come back and they just join the population, join the workforce, no questions asked? Men are born free. They are free to travel in and out of the country. This is the policy of uh, the government of Afghanistan. There's no questioning. It is their country. They are free to leave and free to come back whenever they want. So you say men are born free, which, again, I guess leads me on to, to another area of concern for, for many people um, is uh, the treatment of women in Afghanistan. Um, it certainly appears that men are first-class citizens and women are, in some instances, third-class citizens. Do you think that's a wrong opinion to have? That is absolutely a wrong opinion to have. Uh, I just want to clarify one point. We don't espouse the standards of the Anglosphere. We do not follow the laws that are created by, by some men in parliaments somewhere uh, that until yesterday saw the black man and the Chinese and the Arab as subhuman, as savages, they ravaged their homes and exploited their land. We follow a divine law, it's called Islam. And Islam has in it enshrined the rights of both men and women and children and the parents and the neighbor and the animals and the rights of this planet that it has upon the human beings that live on this earth. So it is an all-encompassing religion and all Muslims that uh, believe in the religion of Islam, uh, they know their rights very well and they are in no way, shape or form uh, second or third class citizens. So are men and women equal in Islam? Yes. Okay. Because, I, again, I can only go on what I have seen and I'm, I'm not taking any other opinions or views into consideration. I'm just going on what I have seen in the time that I have been here. This society is about 95% majority male that I can see. Um, any women that I have seen, I've seen begging. They don't appear to be working in shops. They don't drive cars. They're invisible. Um, and I don't think that that is an equal society. Uh, Afghan society is 50% men and 50% women. So it's not 95% men. Uh, secondly, uh, the Afghan society is distinct, it has a distinct culture. It has nothing to do, and, and the indicator of equality being that if there's 10 drivers, men, that there has to be 10 women drivers, that is not the standards that we live by. Can women drive though? Of course. They're, they're allowed driving to drive. In Kabul. They're driving in Kabul. They're driving in Kabul? Yes. Okay. Yes, I just haven't them. seen any, I have seen... Yes, but it's uh, the... The percentage, like you said, the percentage is not up to basically to par with Ireland or England or, or the United States. Uh, that is a different issue and we do not see equality of men and women being equal that they have to be, if there's 10 drivers then there has to be 10 female drivers, if there's 10 shop owners of men then there has to be 10 female. I'm, so, I'm sorry if you misunderstood me, that's not my interpretation either, I'm not talking about balance, I don't think it has to be a balanced society, um, but from what I have seen there aren't very many women visible and I also take your point that you know the, the Afghan society is comprised of 50% men and 50% women, 
but what I see with my eyes visible on the streets, I don't see a lot of women. And when I walk on the streets, my male cameraman is greeted very friendly. People are, are very nice to him and say hello and very polite. They don't really speak to me. Um, and I can only tell you that as a woman, how that makes me feel is, is it's intimidating and it makes me feel quite insignificant. Um, so I can only imagine what it's like for women who live in this country. I am just a visitor. And, and I, have, I have to say that the people who I have spoken to have been extremely courteous and very lovely. Um, but generally, I, I feel that women are treated quite differently to men. Uh, <clears throat> again, I have to point uh, out the fact that we are a distinct society. We have different values, different culture. And what you have experienced of uh, your colleague being greeted very openly and they shake his hands and even some hug him uh, and they do not talk to you, that is actually an indication of our respect. This is how we show respect to women. We're not a Western society. So you think women are respected by sitting on streets begging? Are women allowed to have bank accounts? Course, are they in of some... The, the begging is not respect. It is not honorable. It is they're begging because the Western nations have sanctioned us. It is not they, they, they don't beg because they, are, they don't have the right to have a bank account or they don't have the right to work. That is not why they're begging. They're begging because the Western nations have sanctioned us. The economic situation has deteriorated. That is the reason they're begging. You should be asking and looking for the source of the begging, not, not the apparent. You should go ask the beggar, why are you begging? In some, in some parts of Afghanistan, I believe women still have mahrams, who are their male chaperones and have to have male chaperones. I, 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 I know it's a different culture. I really appreciate that. And I, I try really hard not to try and impose my Western values on a country that has its own indigenous culture, which I respect. But having a, a male, it could be a child, speak up for me as an adult, that's not respectful of me. I, I don't see how that can be respectful. In your view, that's not respectful. In our view, that is very respectful. In our culture, that is very respectful. As for chaperones uh, or mahram, Islam is very clear on that subject. This is a distance which they quantifies as, as uh, rounds to around 80 kilometers. If a woman is traveling farther than that for her own safety, she has to have a male mahram, a relative, to accompany her so that nothing unfortunate happens in the way. In terms of walking around in the city, going from one house to the other, from village to another, there's no need for mahrams. So I spoke to a, a doctor, um, an Irish doctor who worked for MSF, and she, she worked in Kandahar, and she told me from her experience, she worked in a maternity hospital, and she said that, some, that often if a woman needed life-saving treatment during birth, you had to go and ask permission from the mahram, who might be outside, there might be hundreds of people outside. You had to find that person and get their permission to save the woman's life. Is that true? What is uh, consent? When a person goes to a hospital and they need life-saving uh, treatment for a heart attack, for any other uh, illness, whether it's during, during childbirth or, or any other thing, you need consent of of the family, of the person himself. And uh, when a person gives his consent or hasn't given a consent, it's only natural for you to go and ask the family whether they give consent. And the woman, uh, uh, this is the first time I've actually heard this, when a person goes to a hospital, uh, especially as you said for maternity, maternity care, they entrust the doctor to do what is right. So they would not have to ask for... No, they, they, they don't not have to. Have that, in that, that, case. That, that itself is an act of giving consent. So as far as, as, far as you're concerned, as far as, as far as you see it, 
men and women, women are equal here. Yes, absolutely. God has created both men and women equal. So this week it's International Women's Day across the world. Um, as you know, it's a day which celebrates um, and empowers women. Um, how would you like Afghanistan in the future? Would you like it to celebrate International Women's Day? Do you see it as being something that could be uh, brought into the culture here? Uh, how do I see Afghanistan in the future? In terms of International Women's Day. I mean, you... Specifically you, International Women's Day? Yeah, yeah. Specifically, because it's this week, and, you know, I'm just interested if, you know, do you see the the lot of women here, do you think it needs improving, or you, do you think that it's it's so, everything is, is they're, they're equal and it's fine and there is no issue? Of course there's ills in every society. There's ills in, in the Irish society. Twenty years back there was different laws and regulations of what women could do and couldn't do. Forty years before that there was different laws what they could and couldn't do. I'm pretty sure seventy years earlier women in Ireland weren't allowed to vote. They weren't seen as equal to men. There's ills in societies. We accept that fact that some of the cultural practices contradict Islam and the rights that are afforded to men and women in Islam. We, we accept that fact and we always look for reforms and improvements. So you think there will be progression on that front? Of course. Of course. Um, moving on slightly, um, as a woman in Ireland, um, I contribute to my family, I pay my 50% of, of our mortgage and our house. Um, I am very much an equal contributor. Um, I wonder how the Afghan economy can survive or prosper if half of the workforce are kept out of the uh, creation of, of, of money, for better, for turn of a better phrase, or for a better, want of a better phrase rather. How can the economy? How can the economy um, grow if 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 women are effectively being shut out? When I drive down the street in a, in Kabul and I look at the shops, there are no or very few kind of shops that would cater for women, hairdressers, somewhere to do nails, to buy makeup, to buy clothes. It that it's all very male dominated. Again. It, how do you see, the, is the economy, is it, is it more about the ideology or the economy prospering as far as you're concerned? The, first we have to address the economic problem. That is what is holding everything back. Ma majority of our men are unemployed because of the sanction. Let's just for one minute forget about the women. The men that are supposed to provide for the family, majority of them don't have employment opportunities in Afghanistan because of international sanctions and non-recognition and the, the collective punishment uh, of our people. As for uh, women uh, contribution to economy, we have not imposed any restrictions on them. Women in the private sector, are, there's many, as you pointed out, hair salons, and other salons and, and, and shops that cater specifically to women. There's, perhaps you haven't visited, probably traveled in, in, in Kabul, maybe when you travel, you, that notion will also be uh, you know, corrected. But there's no, uh, no lack of uh, accommodation or, or, or uh, fulfilling the needs of what women want. So is that encouraged? Would that be encouraged? Uh, of course, trade is encouraged, work is encouraged, and we're doing our very best as a government of Afghanistan to provide opportunities to both men and women to work. There's no restrictions on, on any of that. So go back to this, to go to go back to the sanctions um, in terms of foreign aid and foreign investment. Um, a, a lot of the problems that foreign donors say they have is to do with women. So perhaps if the treatment of, of women in Afghanistan was seen to be improved upon or that their rights were being bolstered, that might help the financial aid situation and, and the men could then work as well. It's, it seems to be at this 
impasse at the minute whereby foreign aid won't come in because there are issues in terms of um, women, for one example. Um, and maybe that's a, a very practical way that, that you could ensure that that foreign aid does come in if you improve the lives of women here. Again, there's no restrictions on, on the lives of women. I don't know where, where, the, where that notion comes from. There's no restrictions on women, on, on their freedoms, on their liberties. If the donor countries want us to first turn into a Western society and then they will give us donations, we do not need donations. We do not need their charity. What we're asking for is to be treated as equal human beings, to have our most fundamental right, which is the right of life and the right of existence. We are human beings. We deserve and have to be given our right to life. And we are distinct in our culture and our practices and our beliefs. We need our fundamental right of existence. If the world has the, the decency and, and the sense of justice to accept those facts, I think everything will be addressed. But unfortunately, what they try to physically colonize and change and transform the, the other words that they like to use, the, the society, the Afghan society, they failed to do it militarily. Now it is more an economic war that is being waged against these people. I, don't, I really don't want to dwell on, on the, the, the women issue. I, I honestly don't, and I respect everything you say, and I, I really understand what you're trying to say, or what, what you're not trying to say, you're saying it. Um, but I, I cannot see how society here is equal. I just cannot see it. I, you, you said that I'm wrong. Um, I gave you the example of traveling to... I did not say you're wrong, please. Okay. Uh, perhaps you misunderstood me. I did not say you're wrong. I said from your perspective, living in Ireland, born and bred in, a, in another nation, you see laws differently. You see values differently. You see equality differently. What, what you see as equality is perhaps not how I see equality because there's no set definition of what equality is. For you, your laws are drawn up by men in parliament who yesterday... And did, women. Men and women. But the, by men, I mean human beings, your lawmakers. They draw up laws in their parliaments. 20 years earlier, it was something else. Women weren't given the right to vote. And 20 years later, they were given the right to vote. And you have lived in this society. For us, our laws are drawn from our divine religion. I, I, I understand that, and I, and I, I get what you're saying. Um, I just, you, you talk, you've spoken quite a bit about human rights and how Islam, you know, uh, protects human rights, and we are all human beings. And I just, I just cannot equate equality with, with what is happening in, Af in Afghan society. Men and women do not share the same place here. Men are here, women are here. That, that is what I see. And, and as I said to you uh, the other day on the plane when I came to Kabul, it was all men. And, and, and how it made me feel as a woman, you know, it, it's very, very intimidating. So as I said to you, I cannot... And I, I appreciate and understand that fact, that you cannot see us as being equal. We see our men and women as equal in their rights. They are equal in humanity and they're equal in their rights. We see it that way. But again, your understanding of equality is different than ours. And that is the message we're trying to get across. That there's a difference of understanding. And just as we appreciate your society, please appreciate and respect our society. It has to be based on mutual respect for one another. Men are different genetically, women are different genetically. Our religion, Islam, has given each one of them their own rights for men and for, men, for women, but they are equal in their humanity. Can you, can you explain to me, because I, I, I apologize, I should, know, I should know more about Islam and the teachings, the burqa. Again, through my Western eyes, I see that women are blocked, they are uh, shielded from society. You cannot see their face. You cannot see their expressions. Uh, t 
to, to me, that feels that they, it's like they are invisible in a way. What is the teaching around the wearing of a burqa? What, why is it, um, is it something that is a necessary for women here to wear? So that is from your point of view. From our point of view, uh, women being sexualized and objectified is something that is unacceptable. But again, this is a distinction. I'm just trying to get across the fact that there's different understandings of how humans should live. You base your values on something, laws that are different than what we base our laws on. As coming for, uh, to the, your question about hijab, uh, specifically burqa. Burqa is something distinct to Afghanistan. It is something cultural. Uh, Islam orders women to wear the hijab. Just as Mother Mary wore the hijab, she was covered. Just as the, uh, the, the, the religious women in, in Christianity, they covered themselves up. It's a hijab. There's no difference between that hijab and what Islam uh, prescribed. But that was centuries ago. Mother Mary wore a hijab centuries ago. It's 2022. Millennia ago. Millenniums ago. Yeah, not centuries. But, but the rule, again, we espouse and we believe in the laws that are sent by, by our divine being, the God, the creator of the earth and the universe and the human beings. For you, again, I'm telling you, um, the message I'm trying to get across is for you, your laws change and evolve. Ours are a set of laws sent by God and we, we believe it to be divine and we follow those laws. And they don't change. So does, does that mean that you're, you can't be progressive? That progression is something that you do not pursue because your laws were set millennia ago and you were going to stick by those laws. Is, is that a fair assessment? If by progression, uh, if pro progress means the, the nakedness of women in the public sphere, we absolutely reject that notion. If by progress you mean progress scientifically, economically, uh, culturally, Islam has been the, the standard which the world subscribes to. Islam has a, if you read the history of Islam and Muslims, they are actually the pioneers in the fields of science, astronomy, mathematics. So if by progress you mean women and them uncovering themselves, we do not allow that. If by progress you mean scientific and economic and social development, that's what we uh, ascribe to. Final point on this, I do not go naked in public, I wear respectful clothes, I don't show flesh unnecessarily, I don't think that is disrespectful, um, I, I, I think that by, by ha it feels to me that women are being hidden away um, and that's, that's the impression that, that you get but I take your point. Are the nuns hidden away? Um, increasingly they're not. Nuns have moved on and they don't, you know, a lot of them now don't wear habits and yeah, they progress too. That's, you know, I guess that's so the point. So throwing away the veil, that means it's progress? Well, no, I mean, maybe. Maybe, maybe it is. Again, if, if by throwing away the veil you mean it's progress, then we're not progressing, ever. If by progress you mean scientific, social, economic development, we, will, we have progressed, we're actually the pioneers in, in those fields. I, I think, again, I, I don't want to labour this point, but I think throwing away the veil, it's not about progression, it's about choice. It's about having the choice to do something, and that does seem to be denied people here. Does the Western society give people the choice to walk around naked? Without any clothes? They give people personal choice to dress how they wish. No, in, in public. Will they give them the choice? They give no, them they, personal choice. Do they give choice? women and men the choice to walk around well, in you, public you absolutely naked? Yeah, you wouldn't walk around absolutely naked. That would but be indecent. Do they have the choice to do it legally, without being in arrested? their own home, in public? In the, no, in public. In public, no, they wouldn't. That would be indecent. But they do saying. have the choice to no. wear what they want. And that is what we're saying. In the private homes, they can wear whatever they want. But in public, they have to have uh, modesty. With a, a burqa. 
with a veil. Yes. With a veil. Okay, so look, we'll move on. Um, we'll talk about the sanctions and the we're here. Um, a huge part of why we're here is to look at the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan right now. Um, the people who we've spoken to, um, they say that things are, are very bad. Um, in terms of uh, money, employment, which you've mentioned. Um, we understand from UNICEF, from other NGOs that we've been in touch with, that there is extreme poverty, in, especially in, in some of the rural areas. Um, and, I mean, obviously, as a government, you don't want to see that happen to, to, your, um, to your people. Uh, yes, that, that, is, uh, that is true. The sanctions that are imposed, the human, hum, human man-made humanitarian crisis unfolding in Afghanistan is man-made. It is by the sanctions. It is by the international community, the, the champions of human rights not allowing the right of life of Afghans, not giving them the right, the fundamental right of life. They're given them a choice, either change your society to ours or we will starve you to death. But most countries that aren't aid dependent make their own money. So. If you, if, if, I, if, if I, you were going to give me money, you might say to me, Emer, you have to wear a veil because here's my money um, and I'm giving it to you. But, you know, there are conditions. Um, and uh, I made this point earlier. We're, we're not looking for charity. We're not looking for donations. We are looking uh, for the world to accept us as equals, as equal human beings, to give us our right uh, and access to international markets and international banking system and to allow other countries that do wish to invest in, our, in, in Afghanistan for, to work for its development economically, socially, to have that right to do so. What the world uh, uh, has unjustly done is stop people from, from uh, contributing and helping Afghanistan and investing in, our, in, the, in the vast resources that we do have. That is the problem. We are, not, we are a very proud nation. We do not want anyone's charity. Can you understand, though, that maybe some donors are concerned about human rights in this country that we've discussed and that they're using this leverage to try and ensure that human rights are enshrined? Can you understand that point of view? Again, the, this, coming back to my point, they're, they're, they're threatening people with starvation and death and taking away their right of life and existence to be distinct and different from you uh, with, with, with such uh, what they like to call leverage. They kill a million children, they call it some leverage. It's not leverage. You're killing children, you're ki killing women, you're killing men, you're killing elderly. But are they threatening people or are they just choosing to withhold or, you know? It's not about donations. Uh, we do not seek donations. We do not want their donations. We do not, we're not a charity uh, people who live off charity. We're asking for access to be accepted as human beings, to have the chance to coexist. That's what we're asking for. And they've imposed sanctions on individuals and on the country where other countries are unable to trade with us. They're unable to invest in Afghanistan because then they will face the same thing and their, millions of their children will die. So how concerned are you at the, the current situation in terms of poverty and malnutrition and lack of employment? And it's just a, 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 a cycle that keeps repeating. And, and ultimately, you know, the people that we've spoken to here all welcome the peace. You know, everyone says it's really peaceful now. But it seems that the price of peace is extreme poverty and malnutrition. How concerned are you about that? Uh, as, as a government, uh, uh, of Afghanistan as a representative of the people of Afghanistan. Of course, we are very concerned. There's no doubt about our concerns. And that's why we ha have been engaging with the world to make them understand that killing children is not going to achieve what they're trying to achieve. Imposing sanctions is not going to achieve those aims. And we, from our part, are doing everything possible. We have an economic plan in place. We have got rid, uh, rid of corruption, the endemic corruption that existed. Our revenues have actually increased, despite the fact that the trade uh, and economic activity has decreased. And we are providing people with services to the best of our abilities. And we will continue to push and, and uh, exert efforts in improving the situation. And just very finally, uh, you mentioned to me earlier um, that 
uh, the West had turned its back on Afghanistan, but it was now beginning to turn its front to Afghanistan again. Do you think that there is a, um, a potential for working with some of these countries which maybe in the past there have been issues with? Do you think there is hope there? Yes, I absolutely see hope. We live in a global village and you cannot ignore any neighbour or any individual in that village. We are closely knit, the international community, and uh, we see rays of hope and we see uh, those translate into actions, not only by us but also by the international community. We feel that we are coming closer together, that we are coming to the to the stage where we accept each other for who we are. Uh, so I think there is uh, a lot of room for us and the West to work together. So if I were to come here, and Mark and I were to come here in five years, ten years' time, what sort of Afghanistan do you think we'll find? Well, our hope is that uh, you will find an Afghanistan that has, uh, it has achieved peace now to achieve uh, economic elevation uh, for big projects to have started for mineral extraction to have started, for investment to have come in, and Afghanistan to have uh, achieved its ultimate goal. Well, the ultimate goal is being the crossroads of Asia uh, and bringing prosperity uh, to our people, reviving the Silk Road. Uh, that is our ultimate goal, but in five years' time, we're hopeful that some of the projects for us to achieve uh, that aim will be, uh, will be uh, you know, achieved as well. And how will it be for women? Uh, women will hopefully, the, some of the cultural uh, practices that are frowned upon not only by us but also by the West, uh, that they will be uh, given all the Islamic rights in five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.